to the 2009 Orientare Lumen Congress on monasticism. As you know, monasticism in the Eastern tradition is used as a code word for what in general we would refer to as religious life and as the ideal of Christian spiritual life for everyone. Monasticism basically means the life with God. And I would like to discuss with you today a topic without which there is no life with God, the topic of prayer. In Luke 11, verse 1, we read that the disciples, seeing Jesus praying, asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. The kinds of prayer are many, but in this first reflection I am talking about what is usually called private prayer, though of course no prayer is private in the sense of being done alone, since it wells up from the Spirit of God who dwells within us, St. Paul tells us. Furthermore, our prayer is always done in company with the communion of saints to which we belong by baptism. As with everything else in the spiritual life, Jesus is the model of our prayer. How did Jesus pray? He prayed liturgically, for the New Testament presents him participating in the Jewish festivals, in the cult of the Jerusalem temple, and in the synagogue, that is to say, in the Jewish liturgy of his day. More important for this opening reflection of our conference, we also see Jesus praying privately and therefore implicitly teaching us how to pray indirectly, by example. Jesus prays in solitude, especially when conflicted and distressed, as in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying for comfort and relief in his sorrow. He prays to the Father in blessing, adoration, praise, glorification, thanksgiving, petition and intercession. He prays the wonderful prayer of farewell to his disciples in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. He prays in anguish at the hour of his death on the cross. When asked directly how to pray, Jesus teaches his disciples the Our Father as the ideal model. He also instructs them to pray without making a show of it, but quietly, humbly, and in the Spirit not with long prayers in public like the Pharisees, but in solitude, using few words, humbly asking forgiveness like the publican. Jesus tells us to pray persistently, even obstinately, pestering God until he gives us what we want just to get rid of us. And we see Jesus' own example praying in the morning, in the evening, keeping night vigils, and exhorting his disciples to do the same, telling them to watch and pray, for we know not the day nor the hour. Jesus also teaches us to pray always and not to lose heart, to pray with faith and confidence, because he assures us our prayers will be answered, though of course not necessarily in the way we want. For as we pray in the prayer of the third antiphon of the Byzantine Divine Liturgy, fulfill now the requests of your servants in all things good for us. So Jesus shows us that there is nothing for which we cannot pray except sin. He teaches us prayer of petition and thanks and sorrow and pardon and importunity and even complaint. And this prayer is both Christian and Trinitarian. One can pray to the Father in Jesus' name, one can pray to Jesus directly, 
and one can pray to the Holy Spirit as in the Byzantine heavenly king consolo spirit of truth trubarion, or the Latin prayer come Holy Spirit. Christian prayer is also Marian prayer, for we imitate the fiat of Luke 1.38 and the magnificat, Luke 1.46-55, of the Theotokos, and constantly invoke her intercession. As to when we should pray, Jesus commands us to pray always, an injunction repeated several times in the New Testament. And from the start, beginning with the New Testament itself, we see the first Christians following Jesus' example of prayer. From then on, the fathers and mothers of the apostolic churches of East and West, right up to the spiritual fathers and mothers of today, maintain this teaching and follow this example. But what is prayer? How do these spiritual guides define or describe prayer? What in their view does it mean to pray? St. John Damascene, last of the Greek fathers, wrote in his classic treatise on the Orthodox faith that prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart to God, or the requesting of good things from God. More recently, St. Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower, surely one of the most beloved saints of the 20th century, dear to Christians of both East and West, said more simply, in more directly feminine terms, for me prayer is a surge of the heart, it is a simple look turned toward heaven. It is a cry of recognition and of love, embracing both trial and joy. So prayer is always a turning toward God in any one or all of the multiple ways it has given us to do that, in words or without, in thought, in love, in anguish or sorrow, in joy or desperation, in thanks or complaint. There are no limits to it, and there is no definition that can exhaust its fullness, for its ways are myriad. Prayer is talking, but also listening. Prayer is asking, but also receiving. For prayer is not our gift to God, but his to us in the Spirit, the paraclete or comforter he has sent to be with us always. For a more full and technical modern definition of prayer, we find the following in the excellent catechism of the Catholic Church, which, which tells us that Christian prayer is a covenant relationship between God and man in Christ. It is the action of God and man springing forth from both the Holy Spirit and ourselves, wholly directed to the Father in union with the human will of the Son of God made man. In the New Covenant, prayer is the living relationship of the children of God with their Father, who is good beyond measure, with His Son Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. The grace of the Kingdom is the union of the entire Holy and Royal Trinity with the whole human Spirit. Thus the life of prayer is the habit of being in the presence of the thrice Holy God and in communion with Him. This communion of life is always possible, because through baptism we have already been united with Christ. Prayer is Christian insofar as it is communion with Christ and extends throughout the Church, which is His body. Its dimensions are those of Christ's love. Spiritual writers describe many ways of prayer, some of them overlapping and more or less synonymous. There is liturgical prayer, vocal prayer, mental prayer, meditation, contemplation, Lexio Divina, Hesychia, or the Prayer of Quiet, as it was called in the West. Some of these terms are open to misunderstanding, however. Mental prayer or meditation, for instance, might be mistaken for just thinking or reflecting, which in itself is not prayer at all. And some spiritual writers devalue vocal prayer as if it were second-rate, considered just words recited by rote, with no necessary interiority. Indeed, there have been times in the history of the Church when even liturgical prayer was looked on much in the same way and considered secondary to contemplation or interior prayer. The truth of the matter, however, is that most methods of prayer include all or at least several of the many ways of prayer. One contemplates an icon, meditates on a psalm or other spiritual text or spiritual topic. Reflection on this holy icon or divine word moves one's heart and inspires one to speak to God 
about what is on one's mind and in one's heart, and then to listen attentively for the response of His grace. The same with vocal prayer, or the prayer called Lexio Divina, spiritual reading in the ancient tradition of Western monasticism. It is not just spiritual reading of some biased text, but a slow, prayerful, meditative reading during which one pauses as the heart is moved to ponder and speak to God of what has moved one's spirit. This is the same as the classic second method of prayer, of St. Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual exercises. And St. Jean-Baptiste Marie Vianney, better known as the Curé d'Ars, recounts how one of his French peasant parishioners called contemplation a gaze of faith, a communion of love. When asked to describe his prayer before the tabernacle, he said, I look at Jesus, and he looks at me. All these ways of prayer are found, if under different names, in the classical Eastern and Western spiritual writers. One of my favorites is 19th century Russian Orthodox Bishop St. Feofan Zadvornik, or Theophan the Recluse, a spiritual master who lived from 1815 to 1894. Ordained a bishop in 1860, after six years he resigned and retired to a small monastery to live a life of prayer and seclusion. Feofan, who calls prayer standing before God with the mind in the heart, distinguishes three degrees of prayer, bodily or vocal prayer, prayer of the mind, and prayer of the heart, or prayer of the mind in the heart. Oral or vocal prayers, Feofan teaches, in an insight of genius, originated as purely spiritual prayers that only later became oral by being written down. When we pray them now, we must reverse the process, he writes, and enter into the spirit of the prayers which you hear and read, reproducing them in your heart, and in this way offer them up from your heart to God, as if they had been born in your own heart under the action of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Then and then alone is the prayer pleasing to God. How can we attain such a prayer? Ponder carefully on the prayers which you have to read in your prayer book. Feel them deeply, even learn them by heart, and so when you pray you will express that which is already deeply felt in your heart. The same is true of the liturgical chants. Citing the teaching of St. John Chrysostom, St. Feofan says, the songs must primarily be spiritually and sung not only by the tongue, but also by the heart. By the continual practice of this prayer with the mind and the heart, one's prayer becomes spiritualized and takes on a life of its own, becoming self-moving, as St. Feofan calls it, when prayer exists and acts on its own, that is to say, is moved by the grace of the Spirit and not by one's own human will. Slowly, words disappear from the prayer, which becomes the heart's wordless, unceasing prayer of love. There is nothing whatever in this description of progress in interior prayer that is foreign to Western spirituality, despite the frantic attempts of the cliché mongers to seek everywhere irreconcilable differences between East and West. The early Hesychists also evolved a physical method, a method of bodily posture and breathing techniques to foster this state of prayer, and there is something akin to it in the third method of prayer in St. Ignatius Loyola's spiritual exercises. But Feofan and other authoritative 19th century Russian masters, like Bishop Ignacy Branchaninov, were somewhat reticent with regard to this physical method. Basically, what these authors, East and West, are talking about is what I call the interiorizing of vocal and liturgical prayer, taking the written text and making it one's own by praying it in one's heart, so that when one returns to it again and again, it is no longer someone else's prayer, but has become the movement of one's own heart. This is the type of prayer that I like to recommend to those who have so much to do that they cannot themsel devote themselves totally to a life of prayer like a monastic hermit living in his skeet. I call it the prayer of the busy person, a way of prayer suitable 
for monastics as well as non-monastic priests and others busily engaged in the pastoral ministry, for those distracted by the cares of administering a parish perhaps, while at the same time bringing up and supporting a family. This sort of life is very much like the one I live as a Jesuit, and this is the sort of prayer I have learned to do amidst the hectic cares of my work. Though vowed to the monastic ideal in the Eastern sense of the educated monks of orthodoxy engaged in the work of the Church, Jesuits lead a busy, active life in the world. The underlying Ignatian or Jesuit vision of this world, inherited from our founder St. Ignatius of Loyola, is that only God can save it, but that he has chosen to use us as instruments in so doing. One of my favorite prayers, that of St. Teresa of Avila, a contemporary of St. Ignatius in the 16th century, expresses this vision perfectly. The prayer says, Christ has no body now but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion must look out on the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he is to bless us now. The same vision is expressed in the Byzantine liturgical tradition by the feasts known as the Synaxis in Greek or Sabor in Slavonic, which fall in the liturgical calendar on the day following a major feast of salvation history. They celebrate the role of those human figures intimately associated with the saving mystery of the preceding day. Mary's parents, Saints Joachim and Anne on September 9th, the day after the Nativity of the Theotokos. Mary the Mother of God on December 26th, the day after the Nativity of her Divine Son. John the Baptist on January 7th, the day after the Theophany and Baptism of Jesus. All indicate the same doctrine of our faith that by entering our human history through the incarnation of his divine Son, God willed to associate us in his work of salvation. That's what we call the Church. The Church is the body of those who are associated with God in his work of salvation. This vision, equally Ignatian and Byzantine, is fundamentally different from the modern humanistic and secular social ideal which pretends that humans can of themselves create the society they choose, free of human despotism, historical determinism, and supernatural authority. But it is equally different from the ideal of early and eastern monasticism with its radical eschatological orientation and rejection of this world. On the contrary, Ignatian service and prayer, in the words of Jesuit Karl Rana, whom many consider the greatest Catholic theologian of the 20th century, is rooted in a positive, amicable, and joyous relationship with the world. As the former Jesuit Father General Peter Hans Kolvenbach noted, Ignatian spirituality does not insist on seeking God outside of created things, but rather finding him in them and recognizing fully their autonomous existence in a state of dependence as created objects. The condition of this cooperation in God's design for the human race, however, is that we, the human instruments, be united with God. And that is where prayer comes in. Without prayer there is no such thing as a spiritual life, no possibility of being united with God, no chance of being His instrument in the salvation of the world. And I might add, no chance of living a happy and fulfilled religious or Christian life for without prayer we are not living in and with God, and that is the monastic ideal, which in the Eastern tradition is considered the ideal of all. Monasticism and Christian life is the life with God. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church states peremptorily, prayer is a vital necessity. Prayer and Christian life are inseparable. Immersed in this world, we need the Bless This Mess spirituality, so aptly expressed by Michael Hollings, the harried, overworked, urban parish priest of St. Mary of the Angels in Bayswater, London, in an article in the April 29, 1988 London Tablet. Describing his years of study in Rome, Father Hollings recalls Bobby Dyson, 
a Byzantine Rite Jesuit, I had the privilege of meeting and serving as cantor at his divine liturgy during my first visit to Rome in May 1959 on my way back to the United States from my years of teaching in Baghdad, Iraq in the 1950s when I stayed at the Biblical Institute where Father Dyson was professor. Hollings describes how in Rome the most memorable lecturer was a Jesuit, Father Dyson of the Biblical Institute. In four years of scripture lectures we covered almost everything under heaven without ever moving beyond the first three chapters of Genesis. One phrase has always remained in my mind from Father Dyson's teaching about creation. The Hebrew for the early state of the earth was tohu and bohu, trackless waste and emptiness. Since I began to think and pray seriously, I have come to realize that tohu and bohu was not only the situation at the dawn of the world, but continues where I stand today. It is upon this formless mass, this mess, that God works. This so resonated with the way my life sometimes seems that I have saved that clipping these 24 years and still derive wry consolation from it every time I read it. The active life of a minister in today's church is tohu and bohu indeed, but we can give it form and shape through our prayer. What then does my experience recommend as ways of prayer for the busy worker in God's vineyard? First, a few simple but ironclad principles for a life of prayer. One, lead a regular life. Two, keep the method of prayer simple. Three, give your prayer a framework. Fourth, prepare for your prayer. Fifth, keep at it no matter what. First, lead a regular life. Any life, and especially any spiritual life, needs a rule of life. It's pravila. For without regularity, prayer is usually the first thing that falls by the wayside. A Jesuit superior general once wrote that half the problems our Jesuit men have with prayer would disappear if they would just learn to go to bed on time. I say amen to that, since it has also been my own experience. So set yourself a schedule for retiring and rising, except on special days, days off, holidays, whatever, days when church services or other duties may force changes in the usual schedule, and then stick to it. Second, keep the method of prayer simple. In a moment I shall suggest some very basic, tried and proven traditional methods of prayer. I strongly suggest not getting involved in complicated, convoluted methods involving all sorts of mental gymnastics or physical exercises. Third, prepare for prayer. It is a great assist to prayer if one takes a few minutes the night before to prepare the material for the next morning's prayer, to choose the scriptural text, the psalm, the icon, the theme, the prayer text, whatever, whatever one wishes to use as the springboard of the next day's prayer. For example, maybe one is going through the Divine Liturgy day after day, reflecting on and interiorizing each of its prayer texts. If so, read over the prayer for the next day. Or perhaps one is praying one's way through one of the Gospels, chapter by chapter. If so, read over the upcoming chapter the night before. Fourth, give your prayer a framework. This means having a more or less set way to begin your prayer when the circumstances allow it. A minimum framework might comprise, for example, rec recollecting oneself in silence for a moment, recognizing that one is always in the presence of God. Some spiritual writers call this putting oneself in the presence of God, but of course it is God who has put us in his holy presence for always. It is we who have to bring that reality to our consciousness with an act of faith and adoration. Then make a great metonie of Veliki Poklon, that is to say, a bow right down to the floor, and recite the Polnia Nachala, or the full beginning of our Byzantine offices, if you belong to that tradition, beginning with Blessed is our God, up to the triple, O come let us worship and bow down. In other words, the traditional beginning that opens all of our offices. And then focus on the matter of our prayer by asking God 
what we specifically hope to receive from him as the grace or fruit of the day and its prayer. Fifth, keep at it no matter what. There are many obstacles to prayer, overwork, fatigue, anger, depression, discouragement, distraction, temptation, sin. I shall talk about some of these problems shortly, but we should never let them interfere with or destroy our life of prayer. For let me repeat, without prayer there is no Christian spiritual life. What are some ways of prayer that might be useful for the busy worker in God's vineyard or for the person with so many occupations and so many trials in life that really life is one ongoing distraction, making prayer somewhat difficult? What follows deals not with the theory of daily prayer but with its practice and is largely based on my personal experience in an area for which I claim no special expertise and certainly no infallibility. My own experience of what the spiritual literature euphemistically calls spiritual direction has often been negative, and I have no romantic views of my own competence in the process. Furthermore, what appears to me as little better than the tyranny exercised today by spiritual fathers or mothers and confessors in some Eastern Christian traditions who arrogate to themselves the right to refuse people access to Holy Communion is for our times, in my view, an intolerable violation of freedom of conscience. That said, for what it's worth, here are some of my views on the prayer of the busy Christian actively engaged in ministry or in other activities in today's hectic world. First, Lexio Divina. The first way of prayer I recommend is the classic monastic method St. Feofan Zadvorny calls prayer of the mind that leads to the spiritually pure prayer of the mind and the heart, a method similar to what is called in the West Lexio Divina. This consists of placing oneself before God and reading a text of scripture, a psalm, a prayer, a traparion, the apophthegmata, or sayings of the fathers, indeed any spiritual or liturgical text, internalizing it, talking to God about it, and listening in the quiet of one's heart to what he has to say. I find the Psalms ideal for this sort of prayer, and one can do the same contemplating an icon or almost any other religious object that moves one to prayer. Second, interiorizing prayer. What I call interiorizing prayer, a method most useful for sacred ministers whose life is taken up with celebrating the sacred mysteries of the church, applies this Lexio Divina to liturgical texts. By ruminating prayerfully on the prayers of the divine liturgy or other mysteries, one learns to interiorize and intensify one's liturgical life and ministry, making it not only the prayer of the church, but also one's own. This is a prayer that is not restricted only to sacred ministers of the sacraments, but can be used by those who receive them also. Third, distracted prayer. The perhaps infelicitous name distracted prayer, or prayer of distraction, is of my own coining. Contrary to what the spiritual guides tell us to do, I have found it impossible to banish distractions from prayer, and long ago concluded it is useless to try. Rather, I simply fold them into my prayer, making them the subject of my conversation with God, telling him I am a poor sinner, unable to think of him for two minutes without my mind wandering, perhaps having doubts of faith, even erotic thoughts and temptations, asking him to be with me even in my smallness, my sinfulness, my inadequacy. Fourth, prayer anywhere. Prayer anywhere means just what it says. Prayer wherever we find ourselves. Prayer while walking on the sidewalk. Prayer while shopping in the supermarket. Prayer on a train or plane or bus. Prayer in the subway. Prayer wherever. Here too one cannot help but be distracted. Distracted by the crowds. Distracted by attractive women. Distracted by wackos and pests. Turned off by the nuisance of beggars or the homeless. 
Well, my solution is just to pray for them, all of them, together or individually. I place them in God's hands. I ask him to bring the unbelievers and unevangelized to faith in him and to hope in his divine mercy, to bring the unbaptized and unchurched to the saving waters of baptism, to give those in sin his saving grace of conversion and repentance. I ask him to heal the sick and the aged, to comfort the sad and lonely. I thank him for my health of mind and spirit, for the fact that I have many friends to be with me, that I do not have to worry about food and shelter and medical care and the other necessities of life. This kind of prayer anywhere is perfectly Eastern and traditional. As St. John Chrysostom says in his selection on prayer number two, it is possible to offer fervent prayer even while walking in public or strolling alone or seated in your shop or buying or selling or even while cooking. All I have done is give it a modern spin. Fifth, the Jesus Prayer. The Jesus Prayer, a tradition that lies at the very heart of Orthodox spirituality, is also a prayer for everywhere. St. Simeon of Thessalonica, who died in 1429, says this of the holy and deifying Jesus Prayer in chapter 297 of his treatise on divine prayer that has been incorporated into the Philokalia. He says, pray this name always as a prayer with the intellect and with the tongue, whether standing still or walking, whether sitting or lying down, while saying or doing whatever, always striving to do this. The Jesus prayer is in some ways the prayer that would become characteristic of interior prayer in Byzantine Orthodox spirituality. Rooted in the scriptures, it is composed of two elements from the Gospels. The prayer of the blind man in Luke 18, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, and the prayer of the publican in Luke 18, verse 13, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Rooted in the Old Testament reverence for the divine name, the Jesus prayer also finds justification and explanation in several New Testament texts that glorify the name of Jesus and calling out that name in prayer, as in Matthew 1, John 16, Acts 4, Philippians 2, 1 Corinthians 12, and so on. This Jesus prayer is another of my favorite ways of prayer, not only because it works anywhere, but because it is a prayer for forgiveness of which I am always in need, and because it is an ideal prayer for those many times when one is overworked, harassed, tired, upset, feeling low, with no energy for anything else but the comforting Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Repeating it over and over again, counting off the pet petitions on the, on the Chotki, the rosary-like Byzantine prayer chord, it coordinates with one's breathing and gradually takes off by itself, eventually becoming reduced to Jesus' mercy with each breath. Sixth, prayer when in sin. The Jesus Prayer is a prayer of sinners, which we all are, and of which I am the first, as we say in the prayer before Holy Communion. There are times when we feel guilty of serious sin, of having lost God's friendship and grace, of having willingly expelled the Holy Spirit who is dwelling in the temple of our soul. This is a dangerous time for prayer, for we may feel unworthy to approach God even in prayer, that would be a grave mistake, for it is precisely in the fire of prayer that our sins are burned away by the divine compassion and love, and <coughs> we are returned to grace. Perhaps we do not yet have the courage to go to confession. Well, talk to God about your sin. Tell him you fear his wrath, are even afraid to go to confession. Explain to him what happened. Of course, he already knows it better than we do, but no matter. Give him your point of view, tell him how you see it, whatever, but above all, pray. Pray and you will feel his loving forgiveness and call to penitence. Enter and warm your heart and cleanse away your sin, making you ready for the grace of the mystery of confession. And let your own sinfulness, if you are a priest or someone studying for the priesthood, be for you the best lesson on how you must act as confessor and spiritual father, 
never bringing harshness or judgment or the curiosity of unnecessary questioning to your ministry, but only the love and peace of Christ who was crucified not only for your penitent sins, but also for yours. Seventh, praying forward to open the day. At the beginning of the day, we are often preoccupied about what the day will bring, how we will be able to manage the many tasks on our agenda. This is a time to pray forward, as I call it, a sort of spiritual gearing up for the day ahead. The normal material of the daily prayer of the busy servant of God is often the issues we are facing day by day. First of all, we should know what we want to ask for in this prayer. It quod volo, what I want, as said Ignatius Loyola calls it. The aim of the prayer is just to be with God, but we must focus, must know what we want from Him this day. As we move into our prayer, we review the day ahead, ask God's help in what we foresee. Where will we need Him especially today? What specifically do we ask of the Lord this day? Then begin the Lectio Divina of the material chosen for your prayer and read until something slows you down. If nothing seems to work, just settle into God and let the day float by and be with Him in reviewing it. Bring to Him the things on your mind and test your feelings and reactions to them against His presence and ask for His help in all. Eight praying backwards to close the day. At the end of the day, do the same thing in reverse. This is the awareness examine, or consciousness examine, as St. Ignatius' general examination of con conscience is now more subtly called. After praying for the grace of God's illumination, in repentance and thanksgiving, we review the events and feelings, both positive and negative, that surface in our replay of the day. We pray over them in thanks and or sorrow, and look forward to tomorrow and God's help for its tasks and problems. Ninth, the prayer of thankful love. A longer, more substantial prayer of the same sort is my simplified version of St. Ignatius's contemplation to attain the love of God in his spiritual exercises, numbers 230 to 237. It too is an easy prayer when one is tired and discouraged and without much energy, a prayer of great consolation and grace. I just review my whole life from the start, see God's guiding hand through it all, and let my love and gratitude for his providential care well up into prayer of loving thanks. I thank him that he brought me into being, that I was born in a free country to a family of fervent Catholics who had me baptized and raised me in the love of the Church and of our Christian faith and practice, rather than to atheistic or non-Christian parents. I thank him for the Catholic education I received at home and from the Christian brothers in high school, for my vocation and the grace to persevere in it. I thank him for my friends who have loved and supported me. And I ask him to forgive my failings, my infidelities to them and to him, and especially my many sins. This is what I would recommend in general as the ways in which one can very simply but truly pray. Because as I said before, prayer is the very foundation of the life with God. Monastic life, the life of all Christians, means the life with God. And without prayer, there is no such life. Thank you for your attention. In my previous lecture, I spoke to you about the fundamental and absolutely essential importance of prayer, not only in monastic life, but in all Christian life, of which monasticism is considered one of the most important models in the life of the Church. In this present reflection, I would like to discuss one particular type of prayer, a very special prayer, the official prayer of the Church, 
that is to say liturgical prayer, as icon of our life in Christ. For Christian life is liturgy personalized. In 1513, Michelangelo Buonarroti completed the frescoes in the Sistine Chapel in Rome. In the magnificent creation scene, the life-giving finger of God stretches out and almost, but not quite, touches the outstretched finger of the reclining Adam. Liturgy is what fills the gap between those two fingers. For God in the Sistine metaphor is a creating, life-giving, saving, redeeming hand, ever reaching out toward us, and salvation history is the story of our hands, raised or refusing to be raised, in never-ending reception of and thanksgiving for that gift. Of course, here I am using the term liturgy in the broadest Pauline sense to include what the fathers of the Church called the entire economia or commercium, that ongoing saving, give and take between God and us, the Jacob's Ladder of Salvation History. This theology of Christian liturgy flows from the seminal principle of New Testament teaching that all salvation history is recapitulated and personalized in Jesus Christ. Everything in sacred history, every event, object, sacred place, theophany, cult, has been assumed into the person of the incarnate Christ. He is God's eternal word, his new creation and the new Adam, the new Pasch and its Lamb, the new covenant, the new circumcision and the heavenly manna, God's temple, the new sacrifice and its priest, the fulfillment of the Sabbath rest, and the messianic age that has come. All that went before is fulfilled in him. For as Hebrews 10 tells us, the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. And that includes all worship. This revelation lays the foundation for any Christian theology of liturgy and spirituality. True worship pleasing to the Father is none other than the saving life, death, and resurrection of Christ. But since through baptism we too are Christ, our worship is his same sacrificial existence in us. To live is Christ, Paul tells us in Philippians 1, and to be saved is to be conformed to Christ by dying to self and rising to new life in him, who as the last Adam is the definitive form of redeemed human nature. For we know, as Philippians 3 tells us, the power of his resurrection only if we share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. This liturgy of life, our true Christian liturgy, is the Church's common celebration of our salvation in Christ. As such, it is the most perfect expression and realization of the spirituality of the Church. The spiritual life is life in Christ, and this life is created, fed, and renewed in the liturgy. Baptized into the mystery of his death and resurrection, we rise in him, having put on Christ, so that, as Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Henceforth he dwells in us, prays in us, proclaims to us the word of his new covenant, seals it with his sacrifice, feeds us with his sacred body and blood, draws us to penance and conversion, glorifies the Father in us. In proclamation and preaching, he communicates to us his life. In rite and song, he celebrates it with us. In sacramental grace, he gives us the strength to live it. The mystery that is Christ is the center of Christian life, and it is this mystery and nothing else that the Church renews in the liturgy so that we might be drawn into it. When we leave the liturgical assembly to return to our other tasks, we have only to assimilate what we have experienced and realize the mystery in our lives. In a word, to become other Christs. For the purpose of the liturgy is to generate in our lives what the Church realizes for us in its public worship. The spiritual life is just another word for a personal relationship with God, 
and the liturgy is nothing less than the common expression of the Church's relationship with God. This is what justifies the Catholic Church's extraordinary claims about the nature of Christian worship, as in the striking assertion of the Second Vatican Council's Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy Number 2 which says that it is the liturgy through which the work of our redemption is accomplished, and it is through the liturgy especially that the faithful are enabled to express in their lives and manifest to others the mystery of Christ and the real nature of the true Church. Pope Pius XII affirmed the same doctrine in his 1947 encyclical Mediata Dei, the Magna Carta of the modern Catholic liturgical movement. He said it is an unquestionable fact that the work of our redemption is continued and that its fruits are imparted to us through the celebration of the liturgy. Hence he continues, liturgical prayer being the public supplication of the illustrious spouse of Christ is superior to private prayer and the worship rendered to God in union with her divine head is the most efficacious means of achieving sanctity. The implication of that last statement for our spiritual lives should be obvious. Liturgy is at the very center of the redemptive work Christ exercises through the ministry of the Church. Anyone who does not celebrate and live the liturgy of the Church according to the mind of the Church cannot pretend to be either a Christian or an Apostle true to the Church of Christ. But this teaching is not just Catholic. It goes back to the mystery theology of the Fathers of the Church and to the classical Byzantine liturgical commentators, which asserts that liturgy is nothing less than the ongoing saving work of God's only begotten Son. That is why one of the great Latin Fathers, Pope St. Leo the Great, who was Pope from 440 to 461, could dare to say that what was visible in our Redeemer has passed into the liturgy. In other words, what Jesus did historically during his earthly life, he continues to do sacramentally through the liturgical mysteries he celebrates in and with his church. Our basic identity is Christian, and to be Christian is to be another Christ. That is what the liturgy makes us in baptism, nourishes in the Eucharist, and the proclamation and preaching of the word, restores in confession and anointing of the sick. Liturgy, then, is a locus of our spiritual lives because in the liturgy it is Christ himself who forms us into other Christs by conforming us to himself. This is the teaching of St. Nicholas Cavasilas around 1350, greatest of the Byzantine liturgical theologians, in his treatise on the sacraments entitled The Life in Christ. He writes, in the sacred mysteries we depict his burial and proclaim his death. By them we are begotten and formed and wondrously united to our Savior, for they are the means by which we live and move and have our being. Baptism confers being and in short existence according to Christ. It receives us when we are dead and corrupted and leads us to new life. The anointing with chrism perfects him who has received new birth by infusing into him the energy that befits such a life. The Holy Eucharist preserves and continues this life and health, since the bread of life enables us to preserve that which has been acquired and to continue in life. In this way we live in God. So it is through the liturgy that the Spirit of Christ forms us into Christians by inserting us into and conforming us to Christ's life and by continuously nourishing and strengthening that life in us. Another way the liturgy is formative of our Christian lives is when we make it our own, living our lives according to the model the liturgy proposes. For liturgy that is not a reflection of life, liturgy in which the reality symbolized does not correspond to the reality lived, is bad liturgy. In short, the touchstone of our liturgy is whether or not it is being lived out in the communion of our lives. Does the symbolic moment symbolize what we really are? Is our shared celebration of life a sign that we truly live in this way? In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul tells the Corinthian community 
that its Eucharist is no true Eucharist at all, for in their lack of charity they fail to attend to the needs of the body, that is to say of the community as the body of Christ. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment unto himself. Liturgy, therefore, is formative also because it provides us a prophetic voice of judgment on the quality of our Christian lives. So the full, active, conscious, interiorized particip participation in liturgy that the Vatican II liturgy constitution demands requires that we see the liturgy as the true source and font of our spiritual lives. For the liturgical tradition of a local church, we call its rite, like our Byzantine Slavonic rite, is the model of our ecclesial life and the wellspring of the spiritual life of the church. Unless seen in this broader context of the whole of Christian life, what we do in our liturgies does not make much sense, for liturgy is not an end in itself. It is only the means and expression of a life together in Christ. It is that which is primary, a common life of mutual support and generosity, of putting self second so that others can be first. Prayer in common is one of the means to this unity, part of the group's cement, as well as its joyful celebration of the fact that inchoatively, if not perfectly, this unity exists already. For liturgy is a present encounter. Salvation is now. The death and resurrection of Jesus are past events only in their historicity, that is, with respect to us. But they are eternally present in God, who has entered our history, but is not entrapped in it. And they have brought the presence of God among us to fulfillment in Jesus, who is the permanently present saving reality we encounter at every moment of our lives. The saving past we memorialize in liturgy is in fact the efficacious saving event of salvation now, made present once again in symbol. In the risen Lord, creation is at last seen as what it was meant to be, and Christ is Adam, that is, all humankind. But this fulfillment of the past is directed at the future, for just as Christ has become everything and fulfilled all, for us to be fulfilled, we must become Him, and we can do this only by letting Him conform us to Himself, to His pattern, the model of the new creation. It is this remaking of us into a new humanity that is the true worship of the new law and the true identity formation of all Christians. The old cult and priesthood have been replaced by the self-offering of the Son of God, and our worship is to repeat this same pattern in our own lives, a pattern we celebrate in symbol when we gather together to remember what he was and what we must be in him. This, then, is how liturgy is a locus of formation. It grasps us into Christ. To express this identification with Christ, St. Paul uses several compound verbs that begin with the preposition sin, with. I suffer with Christ, I am crucified with Christ, I die with Christ, am buried with Christ, am raised and live with Christ, am carried off to heaven and sit at the right hand of the Father with Christ. This is one of St. Paul's ways of underscoring the necessity of personal participation in redemption. We must put on Christ, as we read in Galatians 13:27, and assimilate him, experience in mystery the principal events by which Christ has saved us, and repeat them in the pattern of our own lives so that we can affirm with Paul in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the New Testament dispensation, therefore, liturgy is simply a celebration of the Christian life, a common celebration of what we have become and are becoming evermore in Christ. How can liturgy do this? because the liturgy of the New Covenant is Jesus Christ. As the classic Antiochene-type Eucharistic prayers, like our Byzantine anaphoras of St. Basil the Great and St. John Chrysostom never tire of repeating, when we were mired in sinfulness, Jesus died for our sins and rose for our salvation, bringing us into unity with God and with one another in Him. According to the New Testament, it is this incarnate Lord and Savior, 
in his self-giving, reconciling obedience to the will of the Father that for the followers of Jesus is the new liturgy. It is this and not a new ritual system that fulfills and replaces what went before. The new temple and its priest and sacrifice and victim, the new creation and the new Adam, the new covenant and the new circumcision and the new Sabbath rest, the new Pasch and its Paschal Lamb are all Jesus Christ in his saving life for others. He is quite simply all in all, as Colossians 3 puts it, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. All that went before is fulfilled in him, for the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, including liturgical realities. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, Colossians 2 tells us. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Our liturgy, then, is this same reality, Jesus Christ, in us. Our true divine service is to be drawn into him, who is our incarnate salvation, and to live out his life, the same pattern he has exemplified for us, dying to sin, to rise to new life in him. In short, our salvation is God's glorification, and he gives it to us, not we to him. He does this through his spirit dwelling and moving in his church. Our liturgies in the narrower sense of our worship services or liturgical celebrations are one privileged ground of this divine encounter, one theophany or revelation of God's saving presence among us in the world today. The New Testament portrays the gatherings of the nascent church to hear the word and break the bread as privileged moments of the presence of the risen Lord. They are by no means, however, the only ground of this encounter, for God does not depend on our liturgies to meet us and call us to him. Since the basis and source of this grace-filled encounter is the death and resurrection of Jesus, all Christian liturgy plays out this single root metaphor of the Paschal mystery as the disclosure to those who will enter it in faith of ultimate reality the final and definitive meaning of all creation and history and life. For the Christian, Jesus is the image of God, and all other experiences and the images to which they give rise are shaped and qualified and reinterpreted in the light of this one, just as the whole experience of Israel was seen as recapitulated in the Exodus covenant event. In short, Christian liturgy is an enactment of the Paschal mystery of Jesus as the disclosure of God and his plan for us. Colossians 1.15 calls Jesus the image of the unseen God, and for the Greek fathers, liturgy is the image of that image. The actuality, the presentness of it all, is because we are celebrating not something from the past, but a permanent, present reality an ongoing call and response, a new life, which we call salvation, that was called into being by saving events that are past, only in their historicity. The salvific events of Jesus' earthly life are more than just an epiphany or sign, more than just a manifestation of salvation. They are the actual means of that salvation, its very instrumental cause. For the same events of the past are passed only in the historical mode of their manifestation, that is, as they are perceived within human history by us. For our tradition teaches with the prologue of John that Jesus Christ is not only man, but also the eternal word of God. As such, he is for all eternity that which he has done. Not only is his saving, self-offering eternal, he is his eternal self-offering. And it is in his presence among us that this sacrifice is eternally present to us. So our liturgy does not celebrate a past event, but a present person who contains forever all he is and was and all he has done for us. That is why the Latin church can sing in the ancient hymn, Yam Pascha Nostrum Christus Est, Pascalis Idem Victima, for our very Pasch is Christ, and he its very paschal victim. 
In other words, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God, is a constitutive component of the liturgy. This is seminal. Jesus is not extrinsic to our worship. He is its foundational constituent. He, Paul tells us, is the head of the body, and con to continue the metaphor, just as in any living body, it is only the signals from the head in their reception and execution by the members that makes the celebration a celebration. If one is missing, Jesus giving or receiving, there is no celebration. But we too are one of liturgy's integral component parts. If according to the New Testament, the new worship, the only cult henceforth worthy of the Father, is the self-giving kenosis of his Son, do not think that leaves us out in the cold. For our worship is that same sacrificial life eternally personalized in the risen Lord, communicated and expressed and lived in us through the Spirit in the worship of the Church. Christian liturgy then is based on the reality of the risen Christ, called liturgie de source in the felicitous phrase of the Melkite Catholic theologian Jean Corbon. Because the risen Christ is humanity glorified, he is present through his Spirit to every place and age, not only as Savior, but as saving not only as Lord, but as priest and sacrifice and victim. Nothing in his being or action is ever past except the historical mode of its manifestation. As the Byzantine liturgy prays to and of him, you are the offerer and the offered, the recipient and the gift. Thomas J. Talley once put it this way, by virtue of the resurrection, Christ is now transhistorical and is available to every moment. We may never speak of the risen Christ in the historical past. The event of his passion is historical, but the Christ who is risen does not exist back there, but here, and as we live on this moving division line between memory and hope, between the memory of his passion and the hope of his coming again, we stand always in the presence of Christ, who is always present to everyone. This is where the real substance of our anamnesis lies. End of quotation. So if the Bible is the word of God and the words of men and women, the liturgy is the saving deeds of God and the actions of those men and women who would live in him. Its purpose, to complete once again our circle and return to the Pauline theology of liturgy with which we began, is to turn you and me into the same reality. The purpose of baptism is to make us cleansing waters and healing and strengthening oil. The purpose of Eucharist is not to change bread and wine, but to change you and me. Through baptism and Eucharist, it is we who are to become Christ for one another and a sign to the world that is yet to hear his name. Our true Christian liturgy, therefore, is just the life of Christ in us that we both live and celebrate. That life is none other than what we call the Holy Spirit. This is salvation, our final goal. The only difference between this and what we hope to enjoy at the final fulfillment is that the mirror spoken of in 1 Corinthians 13 will no longer be needed. As Adrian Nosson put it, the veil shall be removed. As number seven of the Vatican II liturgy constitution affirms, to accomplish so great a work of salvation for the ministry of the Church, Christ is always present in his Church, especially in her liturgical celebrations. He is present in the sacrifice of the Mass, not only in the person of his minister, but especially in the Eucharistic species. By his power he is present in the sacraments, so that when anyone baptizes, it is really Christ himself who baptizes. He is present in his Word, since it is he himself who speaks, when the Holy Scriptures are read in the Church. Lastly, he is present when the Church prays and sings. Down through the centuries, Christian liturgy has celebrated this root metaphor in word and sacrament, principally and most primitively in Baptism, Eucharist, Sunday, and Easter, but also in Matins and Vespers and funerals and weddings and feasts, and indeed whenever Christians have gathered in Jesus' name. As Don Gregory Dix so lyrically expressed it in his liturgical classic, The Shape of the Liturgy, 
At the heart of it all is the Eucharistic action, a thing of an absolute simplicity, the taking, blessing, breaking, and giving of bread, and the taking, blessing, and giving of a cup of wine and water, as these were first done with their new meaning by a young Jew before and after supper with his friends on the night before he died. He had told his friends to do this henceforward with the new meaning for the anonymousness of him, and they have done it always since. Was ever another command so obeyed? For century after century, spreading slowly to every continent and country, and among every race on earth, this action has been done in every conceivable human circumstance for every conceivable human need from infancy and before it to extreme old age and after it, from the pinnacles of earthly greatness to the refuge of fugitives in the caves and dens of the earth. Men have found no better thing to do than this for kings at their crowning and for criminals going to the scaffold, for armies in triumph or for a bride and groom in a little country church, for the proclamation of a dogma or for a good crop of wheat, for the wisdom of the parliament of a mighty nation, or for a sick old woman afraid to die, for a schoolboy sitting in examination, or for Columbus setting out to discover America, for the famine of whole provinces, or for the soul of a dead lover, in thankfulness because my father did not die of pneumonia, for a village headman much tempted to return to fetish because the yams had failed, because the Turk was at the gates of Vienna, for the repentance of Margaret, for the settlement of a strike, for a son, for a barren woman, for Captain so-and-so wounded and prisoner of war, while the lions roared in the nearby amphitheater, on the beach at Dunkirk, while the hiss of scythes in the thick June grass came faintly through the windows of the church, tremulously by an old monk on the 50th anniversary of his vows furtively by an exiled bishop who had hewn timber all day in a prison camp near Murmansk, gorgeously for the canonization of St. Joan of Arc. One could fill many pages with the reasons why men have done this and not tell a hundredth part of them. And best of all, week by week and month by month, on a hundred thousand successive Sundays, faithfully, unfailingly, across all the parishes of Christendom, the pastors have done this just to make the holy people of God. To those who know a little of Christian history, probably the most moving of all the reflections it brings is not the thought of the great events and the well-remembered saints, but of those innumerable millions of entirely obscure faithful men and women, every one with his or her own individual hopes and fears and joys and sorrows and loves, and sins and temptations and prayers, once every whit as vivid and alive as mine are now. They have left no slightest trace in this world, not even a name, but have passed to God utterly forgotten by men. Yet each of them once believed and prayed, as I believe and pray, and found it hard and grew slack and sinned and repented and fell again. Each of them worshipped at the Eucharist and found their thoughts wandering and tried again, and felt heavy and unresponsive and yet knew, just as really and pathetically as I do these things. There was a little ill-spelled, ill-carved, rustic epitaph of the fourth century from Asia Minor, which says, Here sleeps the blessed Chione, who has found Jerusalem, for she prayed much. Not another word is known of Chione, some peasant woman, who lived in that vanished world of Christian Anatolia. But how lovely if all that should survive after sixteen centuries were that one had prayed much, so that the neighbors who saw all one's life were sure one must have found Jerusalem. What did the Sunday Eucharist in her village church every week for a lifetime mean to the blessed Chione and to the millions like her then and every year since? The sheer stupendous quantity of the love of God which this ever-repeated action has drawn from the obscure Christian multitudes through the centuries is in itself an overwhelming thought. All that going of one to the altar every morning. It is because it became embedded deep down in the life of the Christian peoples, coloring all the via vitae of the ordinary man and woman 
marking its personal turning points, marriage, sickness, death and the rest, running through it year by year with the feasts and fasts and the rhythm of the Sundays, that the Eucharistic action became inextricably woven into the public history of the Western world. At Constantinople they do this yet with the identical words and gestures that they use while the silver trumpets of the Vasilevs still called across the Bosphorus in what seems to us now the strange fairy tale land of the Byzantine Empire. In this 20th century, Charles de Foucault in his Hermitage in the Sahara did this with the same rite as Cuthbert 12 centuries before in his Hermitage on Lindisfarne in the Northern Seas. It is not strange that the Eucharist should have this power of laying hold of human life, of grasping it not only in the abstract, but in the particular concrete realities of it, of reaching to anything in it, great impersonal things that rock whole nations, and little tender human things of one man's or one woman's living and dying, laying hold of them and translating them into something beyond time. This was its new meaning from the beginning. The epistle to the Hebrews pictures our Lord as saying from the moment of his birth at Bethlehem, Other sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared for me, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Hebrews 10.5 On the last night of his life it was still the same. This is my body, and now I come to thee. It was the whole perfect human life that had gone before, and all his living of it, that was taken and spoken and deliberately broken and given in the institution of the Eucharist. That says it all. That's what our Eucharist is about. That's what our Christian life is about. For our Christian life is and must be Eucharist liturgy. Thank you for your attention. Amen.